Let me see if I can pull this off. Hang on a minute, hold on. Hold on, let's see how this comes out. How's that coming through? Dear Pat George. I can't believe it. Katrina Madewell is a producer now. <laughs> hey, not bad being on the other side, Thank huh? Thank you very much. Hey, um, do you know how old I am today? Tell or me. Tomorrow? I want to know. 41. I mean, we, we already determined you, you turned tell? 21 I don't during... Mind, I don't mind telling you this. He's 40. Okay, tell Believe me. it or not. Believe it or not, I'm 65 tomorrow. And you are just as spunky as ever. I, you know, and I, I say that because I do. I feel like I'm 40. I act like I'm 16 and 19. And, oh, yes. I would agree with that. I, I party like I'm 25. Agreed. Yes. <laughs> so it's a big party at Bellardo's tonight, or are you saving it for tomorrow? No, it's a two-night party, tonight and tomorrow. Oh, it's a two-night party. He's just not leaving. Oh, yeah. No. I mean, the DeSantis re relaxed no. the, the criteria again. They got a little again. cot for him in the back. He can just sleep no, in no. it. What's going to happen when I get out of Orient Road? I'm going to come right back to Viardo's after tonight. Ah, look at that. All right, so Pat George's birthday party is tonight at Velarda's. Don't know what time, but probably after 5. <laughs> They'll be the ones making all the ruckus. <laughs> so come join us. We are definitely going to go for Pat's birthday. Are you going to make an appearance, Leo? You and your lovely wife know it's too far away for you? No, I, I, if you knew what the rest of my day. After I leave here, I'm on the phone between 10.05 and 7.30. Got it. I have... Lots of phone calls today. Got it, you got, got it. Adam on the line. We do have Adam and Adam. First two minute tip of the week. Tomorrow's Pat George's birthday. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. We're missing you in the studio. We got a full house today. I know, I know. I was listening to it uh, on the way in. A lot of good, uh, a lot of good content this morning. I'm, uh, um, you know, our, our books will be launched soon. Our inventory is so low. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adam. Can I interest you in a family of kittens? Uh, I did hear that part. Unfortunately, we're not in the, the kitten market at the, the moment. So his I'll, lease. Uh, his I'll lease. leave that for you. Get the coffee grounds. I could send his, you the coffee grounds. I think. Uh, I will need. Hey, Adam, I don't have any coffee grounds, so Adam, can I, I borrow some? I thought you told me that your lease said no cats and your renter's insurance didn't cover it. Didn't you say that? Yeah, it, there's a vicious cat list, and uh, I think the ones under your your house are uh, are on that list. So. Did you ever? Yeah, actually, speaking of which, do you ever notice when it comes to dogs, they're like, "This is a bulldog. This is a Labrador." But when it comes to cats, they're like, "This is a fluffy one. This is a skinny one." Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a stinky one. <laughs> yeah, they never say what kind uh, yeah, of cats they are. Yeah. So, what do you got lined up for us this week on insurance? Well, so this week I wanted to talk about dwelling coverage because I get this question all the time, and I'm sure you see it with um, with as many first time home buyers as you uh, as you deal with Katrina. And they always ask me, well, why is my dwelling limit different than my purchase price? Um, and really, what it comes down to is we don't insure the land, right? And purchase price is just what somebody's willing to pay for it. So, you know, for example, you could buy one of those brand new houses down in Southern Hillsborough County and get a really, really good deal from the builder, but we might be insuring that for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 more than you paid for it because that builder's going in, they're building 100 homes at a time, and they're kind of slashing their prices, but if lightning strikes and that house burns down, you're almost looking at, a, you know, it's a, from the ground up. Got to be able to rebuild it. Car is going to yeah. come back and build just one stand standalone house uh conversely and that could happen we actually uh, uh, adam we just showed a property yesterday that the roof was hit by lightning and the whole house burned down um, and it, it was all redone nice where was this yep. um in connerton i think connerton yeah 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 i believe it um and then on the flip side of that you, you get some houses in south tampa where you know it might be a 1500 square foot bungalow but you paid you know eight hundred thousand dollars for it well 
you know, unless it's made out of gold, it's uh, probably not going to cost eight hundred thousand dollars to rebuild a, uh, well, a frame. Yeah, because your, I mean, home, shoot, so. your dirt alone is probably a quarter million bucks. Uh, uh, probably, probably more than that, depending on the area. So we see, you know, we see that um, you know a discrepancy is more common than not. Um, now, while we're on the subject, something that a lot of people may not know is your dwelling limit is going to increase every single year somewhere between two to to four percent typically um so whatever dwelling limit you started with when you first bought that house is not what's going to be on the policy you know four or five years later so is that automatic a lot of people were mm -hmm, yeah it automatically increases so we'll see i've seen it before where people got a what they thought was a rate increase but really the only thing that happened was you know, over the course of three or four years, their home, instead of being 10 years old, is now, you know, 15 years old. And instead of it being insured at 300000 now it's at 375 and Everything kind of comes in line, but the rate, you know, the actual filed rate hasn't changed. They're just kind of going through the rating tiers um, as time goes on. So we'll definitely see that um you know, that, that lead to some increases. So, and I think that's um, really well, conservative so too, Adam. I mean, cause I mean, our yeah. appreciation here is five to 7% historically. And I would say over the last couple of years, it's probably higher than that. Well, again, you got to remember the, you're talking about value where we're talking about rebuild. Um, you know, so it really comes down to labor and materials and that kind of stuff. But they go hand um, in hand, but, right? So, I mean, if you look at the sales right. price and those are going up, the, the supply costs are also going to go up. Maybe. Right? It depends. It depends on the area and everything. Yeah. But, um, but what I was going to say is one of the things to look out for and what I always tell people is, um, you know, we can always redo those replacement cost estimates. Um, so sometimes if it... Um, you know, if it's increasing so much um, that it's kind of outpacing what the house would cost to rebuild, we can redo a, a replacement cost estimate and bring that dwelling limit down a bit and start saving them some money that way. Well, again, um, every year so, when so it's renewing, you should be looking at it to make sure everything's in line. Absolutely. Absolutely. The biggest tip is don't buy that house, get that policy uh, the very first year and then stuff it in a drawer and never look at it again. Yeah, because that never uh, happens. Assume your mortgage company is handling it, you know? So Yeah, you don't uh, want them to do it. That's called yeah. that's called forced place insurance. It's really expensive. Oh no well yeah, that's a whole different topic. But I meant, you know, the, the mortgage company's paying for it so they don't, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, I know. Just kidding so. with you. All right, Adam yeah. Talley, have an amazing and fascinating weekend. Pat George's birthday celebration this weekend, so Pop on I by. I, I, uh, I heard. I, I wished him a happy birthday. And uh, I know he has that Don Julio, that special Don Julio. But, uh, Pat, if you just want a, a regular everyday tequila, I always go with Altos. I'll uh, remember so that. When the bottle's gone, I'll remember my, that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, that's the way. Maybe I'll send it your way. Old uh -huh. birthday treat. But uh, <laughs> thanks, guys. And I hope you guys all have a, a great weekend. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. All right. So do we have Blake also with us, Pat, or is he separate? No, we have him. You can say hello and good okay. morning. Okay. Good morning, Blake. How are you? Doing great. And let me introduce our guest. We have Mr. Blake Gaylord. He is one of the partners with Gaylord, Merlin, Ludovici, and Diaz. Did I get that right? Ludovici, yeah. Ludovici. I was close. Okay. So, uh, fascinating topic we're going to be covering with you this morning. You handle eminent domain. And so for the person listening, that is not an everyday term. Why don't we explain what eminent domain is? Well, eminent domain, whenever you see road work projects, whenever you see uh, something being built, you see those orange cones. Eminent domain is the right of a government authority or a private company who has been granted the right of uh, eminent domain to condemn or take property for a public use. So generally, governments, their public use is for roads and streets and things like that. Private companies like gas pipeline companies and electric utility companies have been given the power of eminent domain by the uh, legislature. So companies like TECO, uh, Florida Gas, Gulf Power, Duke Energy, 
Those are private companies, but they also hold the right of eminent domain to do public projects. Yeah, and um, one of the things we're going to cover today when we come back, because uh, eminent domain is, like you said, the right for the government to take a property for the greater good of the public. And they have to give you fair market compensation. We'll talk about that. And uh, there's a lot of people moving here to Florida. We talk about this every single week on Tampa Home Talk. So when we come back, we're going to cover what that means to an eminent domain attorney like you. All right. This is Tampa Home Talk. I'm your host, Katrina Madewell. Our off-air number, 813-377-2775. 813-377-2775. We'll be back in just a moment. Stick around. Well, good morning. Welcome back. This is Leo Kane with Tampa Home Talk, joined with uh, Blake Gaylord on the phone. We were in the middle of talking about eminent domain when he got rudely interrupted That's by a right. commercial segment. Well, gosh, we don't make the rules. We just have to follow them. It's almost like the commercials thought they had the right to be there and they just took it. I know, right? Sort of like eminent domain. <laughs> so, Blake, let's chat a little bit about all the people moving to Florida. I mean, one of the recent articles said 1,000 people a day, but honestly, I think that number could be higher. Yeah, I mean, the the state of Florida, Florida is a growth state. We've been a growth state. We continue to be a growth state. Uh, and for that's one of the reasons why Florida has some of the best eminent domain laws for landowners is because we have very developed law relating to eminent domain. And the reason we have very developed law relating to eminent domain is that we have so many projects. We have so many things going on all the time. And so uh, when we say we have a developed law, that means that property owners that face eminent domain are protected in unique ways in the state of Florida, uh, place, ways that they're not affected in places like Georgia, uh, some of these non-growth states. Oh, yes. Uh, what, what, Do talk about this, because I, I share about this a little bit with my family. I'd love for you to elaborate on that. Well, in the state of Florida... Uh, our legislature and our constitution recognize something called full compensation and instead of just compensation, which is what the um, U.S. Constitution recognizes. So what full compensation means in the state of Florida is that means that you're entitled to be represented by an attorney at no cost to you. It means that the person or the entity taking your property must compensate you for the taking itself, so the land that they need, plus any damage to your remaining property caused by the project. So a lot of these projects are very good. And, and generally speaking, most people recognize, hey, it's good that traffic is being alleviated. The problem is that if you're taking half of my property to alleviate that traffic, <laughs> you need to pay me. And so there, there's an unequal burden on property owners affected by eminent domain. So the project can be good, it can help the, the public, but then it doesn't it hurts that private property owner. And so Florida law is very, uh, recognizes that uh, very well. And so what are some of the things that you're seeing, like with all these people moving and the new builds everywhere, uh, what does this mean for some of the homeowners like me that were born and raised right here in Tampa? Well, traffic is a funny thing. Um, you know, people in North Tampa are affected by traffic that happens in downtown. And, and the, the biggest project that will affect the Tampa Bay area in the next 10 years is what's referred to as TBX or Tampa Bay Next. Uh, the most, um, th that is a huge multi-billion dollar project that the centerpiece of which will be the reconstruction of the Howard Franklin Bridge. The Howard Franklin Bridge will become the second widest bridge in the world. And uh, that will then, right now, traffic in North Tampa is affected by two places, Malfunction Junction at I-4 and 275, and then at the Veterans Expressway and 275. And so the point of TBX, or one of the points of TBX, is to alleviate those two choke points. If you've ever come, if people are coming in westbound on I-4, the traffic backs up there. Yeah. If coming in southbound on 275 or southbound uh, on the Veterans Expressway, traffic backs up there. So uh, this project 
the point of this project, I think uh, Tampa Bay is the seventh most congested city uh, when, it, when you adjust for size. So of similar size cities in the United States, Tampa is number seven. And the, the uh, city of Tampa in Hillsborough County and the Department of Transportation want to change that. And they want to change that with TBX. And so that is a massive, massive project that's going to alleviate uh, traffic all over the Hillsborough County area. Now, the second thing that it's going to do is the West Shore area will be completely transformed as part of that. Right now, uh, the main north-south roads, uh, if you need to get north of 275 south, you either have to go Dale Mabry, Lois, or West Shore, and that causes congestion on Lois, West Shore, and Dale Mabry. Well, there'll be multiple crossings underneath, the largest of which is going to be at Rio, and so most people don't know where Rio is yet. They will know all about Rio in 10 years. So Rio Street right now is a quiet little street uh, that runs south of Cypress Street. And so if anyone works in the West Shore area, which a lot of people do work in the West Shore area, and they commute, and, and on their commute they get on to uh, 60, which is the Veterans Expressway, and go back to where they live, whether it's in Odessa, West Chase, you know, Lake Magdalene, Lutes, uh, or even in some cases, Pasco County. So anyone that works in West Shore recognizes it's difficult to get onto the Veterans Expressway because you either have to go up O'Brien and then get on Spruce. And so the point of, of the, one of the uh, points of TBX is to alleviate the congestion getting onto the Veterans Expressway. So talk, talk about some more details on the project. With um, TBX, it's, um, the Howard Franklin is going to be wide. What else is going on with that? Well, they're realigning. So there's an awkward transition presently from the Howard Franklin to get on to 275 or to get on to the veterans heading north. You're going to have, you know, that 10 or 12 lanes Right now, if you want to head north coming eastbound off the Howard Franklin, you have only a single lane to get off. That causes a lot of traffic confusion. Uh, at the, if, you've ever, if you've ever tried to come from St. Pete into Tampa after about 3.30 in the afternoon, you know what this problem is because you have this single lane that's coming off. And so what they're going to do is they're aligning, realigning, meaning straightening out 275. And that's going to take a lot of property. Now, one of the problems, though, is that you have the West Shore Plaza Mall. So you can't realign, really. Nobody wants to condemn an entire mall. And so you have some of those smaller properties. And so what they're trying to do to realign it is bump it a little bit north and straighten it without moving 275 south onto the West Shore Plaza Mall, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that area. I mean, and like you talk about just the Howard Franklin. I mean, the, the Beasley Media Studio is over there and you'd have people like myself that would commute there for, for many years would drive across the Howard Franklin. And Pat George will tell you, I mean, what happens when there's an accident on the Howard Franklin and it's shut down? I mean, yeah, but on the Howard Franklin now and correct me if I'm wrong, some of those lanes are going to be toll lanes. Uh, that was something that was considered. They called that kind of the Lexus Lane plan. Um, I'm not sure the status of that. One of the one of the intents is to is as of TBX is to include, you know, a multimodal transportation. And so that there was a talk at one point of making center lanes into what's called a Lexus Lane. Or if you've ever visited Washington D.C. Um, you'll see that they have lanes where you can pay based on volume. So, for example, uh, if you're driving and the traffic is very heavy, then you can pay a premium and get into these other lanes that aren't as heavy. Well, that ends up being a tax on people. Uh, you can either sit, on tra sit in traffic or pay a lot of money. Uh, and, and so there was a lot of controversy about whether that should be included in the plan. It's my understanding that those toll lanes have are not part of the present plan, but that certainly can change. So, Blake, I don't. I, I feel like that's just not fixing the underlying, and I don't know enough about the project to speak on or even comment on it, but uh, the underlying issue is there's no public transportation. So, I mean, you're talking about an area like Tampa and comparing that to 
like Washington that just doesn't, there's no public transportation. So is there anything in this that's feasible being built into this project for public transportation that would take away some of the commuters on the road? Absolutely, that's part of the plan. And so there's, they've already purchased what they call a future multimodal, multimodal center uh, south of Cypress Street between Trask and Manhattan. Uh, if you know where Charlie's Steakhouse is, yeah, and that hotel, that's already that's already owned by DOT. Oh and wow! So part of the goal is within the right of way of the, or the vision is within the right of way of the 275 corridor is to have that multimodal center that will connect uh, St. Pete with downtown Tampa and the uh, international airport. Is that going to be so, rail, or how is it going to connect? Yes rail that's the plan and so when you see a tbx plan you see that that multi multimodal uh plan within that and so whether that happens first i think obviously the first thing you'll see is the establishment of the right-of-way and the construction of the traffic to take care of the automobile traffic but within that right-of-way or the footprint of the new road is a plan to build that uh that rail. Now, Blake, am I correct in saying that you represent a lot of homeowners on these eminent domain? Um, we do. So, so I've been talking about this big project, TBX, but there's a number of smaller projects that have been going on. And so, for example... Oh, wait, wait. Hold on, Blake. Actually, hold that thought. I want to talk to you about that a little bit more. And I also want to know what advice you can give the listeners if some of these changes are affecting them or will be affecting them. Um, stick around. We do have to roll to a break real quick. So hold that thought, Blake. This is Tampa Home Talk. We'll be back in just a moment. Our off-air number is 813-377-2775 if you'd like to get connected with Blake 813-377-2775 back in just a moment well good morning welcome back we have Tan here with Bear You look like you were lost for a no, minute. I like, you were going to do it. Usually Adam takes third segment. This is second segment. Or is third segment? I get, I get confused. Uh, third. 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 Yeah. So, yeah, we have Blake Gaylord joining us today. He's an eminent domain Tampa attorney I, I here in like Tampa. I we need a map on our screen for our viewers when he's describing all these interchanges. Yeah, yeah, because we'll, we'll have to incorporate that maybe in the video, Leo. Yeah, so I have to throw maps up there and <laughs> things of that nature. And then so we, we can point. We talked about some of these big projects, and Blake, you were going to comment on some other stuff, right, that's going on affecting homeowners in the area? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, to, you know, obviously the, the TBX is mostly a commercial. Uh, there's not a ton of homeowners, although there are some home, homeowners who will be very affected by that. Uh, one of the biggest projects that, Hill, that Hillsborough County has undertaken in quite a long time is the uh, Van Dyke Road expansion. If anyone's been on Van Dyke recently oh. uh, between Dale Mabry and the veterans, the, they'll know that there's a number of churches, one of, one of which I attend. Me um, too. <laughs> to, there's a lot of traffic out there, and there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of developments from Calusa Trace uh, all the way down to Gun Highway. So the Van Dyke Road uh, project is going to be a $66 million project. So the county is putting a ton into this. Um, they're doing a few unique things, but there'll be a number of homeowners affected from the Van Dyke Farms. Uh, there's a number of uh, planned communities that are along there. Uh, there'll okay. be walls. So I got a, I got a question for you because you obviously sure. either live or are near that area, and so. Uh, you probably remember back in the day on Cheval when they when they extended the veterans, how Cheval kind of like like literally the veterans runs through parts of Cheval. I've shown properties and there's like pillars for the expressway in the backyard. How the heck did that even happen? <laughs> how did they allow Shaw? Uh, Cheval to be built before they built that extension? Well, I mean, the expressway, when it got extended, literally goes through Cheval, because it used to dead end right there on Del Mabry. And That's then when, right. when they did the extension and took it further north, now it's literally through parts of Cheval. Uh, and it, it just surprises me that that was ever even allowed. Well, what, what's interesting about that is, um, you know, the power of eminent domain is very important because without it, Governments wouldn't be able to plan roads efficiently. What I mean, what I mean by that is, if the government had to had to acquire on the open market every piece of property, 
to build a road, the roads would not run efficiently. They would be all zigzagged all yeah. over the place. Yeah. And so to answer your question, how did they do that? They did that by paying someone a lot of money. Got it. So, so but what about the neighbors that are still there and they didn't actually take their property by eminent domain, but clearly it's affecting them because they now have an expressway in their backyard? Yes, yes. So that's a, that's a good question. And, and the question would be, what happens if I live in a deed-restricted community and the, the project impacts community property but not my property specifically? And that's a common thing, and that's what's going to come up in the, in the Van Dyke Road widening. And so in Florida, Flor- one of the ways that Florida law may not be, uh, people may not consider it fair, is that Florida is what's called a damage I'm sorry, a taking state, because our Constitution says that the co- that compensation must be paid when property is taken. In a place like Texas, the Texas Constitution says compensation must be paid when property is taken or damaged. Here's why that, that matters in, in Florida. Mm. If your property is only damaged but no taking has occurred, then you don't have what is called under law a compensable interest. And so if a road is built 10 feet from your property line, you may have a problem recovering compensation even though you have the noise, vibration, right. sound, all of the things associated with that road because none of your property was actually taken to build it. And so some people would be compensated if the road went right through their property. That's different. Um, but but if, the prop- if the road does not go right through your property, then you can have problems. Uh, being yeah, and by the way, if you if you say, "Well, I'm just going to sell and move," you still have to disclose it. It's not like you can't disclose it if you know it. So, well, disclosure is a very important thing, and here here's another reason why disclosure is important. What do you need to disclose in eminent domain? Eminent domain is a specific proceeding. The state of Florida plans projects all over the place, sometimes 20, 30 years in advance, and those projects never come to fruition. And so from a disclosure standpoint, there's no need to disclose that, you know, something may or may not happen uh, 30 years into the future. Uh, An imminent domain proceeding, so just because the county or somebody has looked at a project does not mean that they're going to do a project. Now, the, the right thing to do would be to say, well, look, they're looking at this project just so you know, um, but from a legal duty, just because something has, um, you know, the county has looked at something but is not actually committed to a project, uh, there, there's not really a legal duty to disclose something that yeah. might or could happen in the distant future. So question for you, if uh, the, the county or one of the municipalities is looking at uh, taking your property for eminent domain, are there homeowners that actually just deal with them directly and don't hire an attorney? There are some. Um, it, it, that's not advisable. Yeah, I can't. Ima- I would never do that. But I'm just curious. Like, does that happen? And if it does, what are people missing out on that they should know? Well, what's really important is that before any government authority goes to exercise the power of eminent domain, they have engineers, they have appraisers, they have attorneys, and they plan out how it's going to work. They go with a specific plan to each property. And so whenever a person is approached by what may seem like a harmless letter, like, hey, we'd like to talk to you about acquiring your property, before that letter was ever sent, there are thousands of hours that have been spent planning and strategizing and doing all this. And so, and they don't even know anything about it, right, until they get the letter? What's that? They don't even know about it until they get the letter? In some cases. Now, in the state of Florida, typically, if, if a project's coming through, you'll get a lot of direct mail from attorneys. Because attorneys mm. generally know about it before property owners do, and so attorneys, the Florida Bar allows attorneys to market to property owners to say, hey, look, this project's coming through, and uh, we'd like to represent you free of cost to you. And so typically, that's, that's usually where a property owner first hears about a project, is through attorney letters that they get, and they say, huh, I didn't know about this. Uh, but it's very important that, that listeners know that getting a letter from an attorney does not mean that eminent domain has started or will definitely come. And so um, for you, are you paid directly by the homeowner, or is that included in some of the expenses in, in the taking, if you will? Uh, attorney's fees in eminent domain case are determined by statute, 
they're independent of the compensation to the property owner. What that means is the statute says requires, let's say, this Van Dyke Road project. Hillsborough County will make property owners an offer. Whatever an attorney is able to achieve for that property owner above that initial offer, Hillsborough County will then pay a percentage, percentage of that benefit to the, um, to the attorney. And so it's separate and distinct because you have mm-hmm. to determine what the benefit is first before you can determine what the attorney's fee. So it's not like a personal injury case where right. uh, a person may be awarded a certain amount of money, and, but they have to pay a, per, a percentage of that to the attorney. Whatever a person is compensated in an eminent domain case, that is their compensation. The attorney's fee is then determined above that. It's not out of that. That's why we say at no cost to you, because it doesn't come from the compensation to the property owner, and that's because of the guarantee of full compensation. And it's, it's, uh, it's possible for you to get more, right, than what they're offering. Absolutely, in virtually every case. Oh, got it. Yeah, it's definitely a complex subject, and I would absolutely recommend, you know, if if you're facing this or you're looking at this or you get a letter, connect with an attorney that knows this. It's their primary niche, if you will, because it's a very complex topic. Uh, Blake, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate all your insight, and we look forward to having you back on updates for these projects. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you for having me. All right. And so we're going to roll on over to Lindsay Bass. She is um, our next attorney for the hour. She's family and probate is what she does. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because we have often shared that uh, probate can be very expensive, right? And there's ways to avoid it. Um, So I would love to chat with you a little bit on some of those details and know, uh, just dive in. Like, first of all, who needs a probate attorney and when? Okay, so when somebody passes away, even if they have a will, most t- most of the time their estate needs to go through probate. The times when it wouldn't need to go through probate is when they don't have anything in their name anymore. So if they have a trust set up and all their assets are in the trust. But otherwise, if they own a home Really or a important vehicle. topic. So let's chat about that for a minute because a lot of people that we see think just because they're in a will, they don't have to go through probate, and that's not true. That home actually has to be in a trust to Cor- avoid probate. Correct, correct. So um, a lot of people think that actually when they come to me, they, they'll tell me, oh, so-and-so had a will, so I don't think it needs to go into probate. And the yeah. will is just directing the, the person in charge of the probate Makes how to disperse the assets. for the, the assets. judge, right? How correct. <laughs> so, um, no, but the trust is really the way to prevent um, assets from going through probate. And, and there's other things you can do as well. You can title a pay on death for, for bank accounts. You can have somebody else named on a deed with you. You can have cars jointly owned. So there are other ways to to do that as well. Um, But if you have a lot of assets, a trust is probably the best way. When you say a lot of assets, what is there a certain number that it makes sense to consider a trust? There's not a certain number. What I tell my clients is that if you're looking to set up a trust, you're really doing that for the benefit of your beneficiaries. So it's it's how much are you trying to protect them? Um, because a trust can be expensive to, to set up. So if, if you're talking one house and one car, it may not be the the best idea for you financially but if you have you know three children and you're trying to protect them and their asset and and and, um you know what they're going to have to deal with if you were to suddenly pass then then you might consider it even if you don't have so much so it's really how much you want to protect those beneficiaries and And there's minor children compared to adult children and different times Mm -hmm. the wills need to be updated and all that and the trust is great for minor children because if you minor children inherit more than fifteen thousand dollars in florida a guardianship has to be set up for them which is really expensive and burdensome so that great point and that's uh, that's set by the court correct right Yeah. yeah And then you, you're you monitored on every bit of spending and uh, annual reports. So I'd love to dive into some of the problems that you actually see in probate cases. I see a lot of infighting between family members. Yeah. Um, Hold on to that. And we'll chat about that a little bit more when we come back after the break. Uh, Lindsay Bash, she's our attorney, talking about family and probate law and some of the things that you might not want to deal with that are much easier to deal with in advance. Our off air number, if you want to get connected, 813 377 2775. Again, 813 377 2775. When we come back, 
Lindsay's going to run into some of the problems that she sees during probate and how best to avoid those back in just a moment. Stick around. Good morning. Welcome back. This is Tampa Home Talk. <laughs> are you making sure I'm going to speak up? Yes, yes, yes. I'm making sure. Um, Leo and I are back with Lindsay for the remainder of the hour. She's our family and probate attorney for the latter part of the show. And some of the things I was asking her is about some of the problems she sees in probate cases. So one of the biggest problems I see, which is not actually covered under probate, is what to do with somebody's remains. So uh, like their ashes, right? And that's what yeah, yeah. The, the siblings or a stepmom and the sibling and the children start fighting over over who's going to get them, and somebody holds on to them. So they can't you split them into smaller urns? You can, and somebody can designate that they want to do that in the in their life. That's not normally covered under property in the will, but that's a separate estate planning thing that we do. Do you actually? See see that like more common than people would think about the fighting over the ashes uh, very common wow very common so and 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 people don't want to think that when they're estate planning they're like my children get along i'm like just wait <laughs> yeah <laughs> because and money can change people too right so i think it's important to have that conversation early with what your plans are if you've got anything specific that you want children to have you know designate that in estate planning and um, paul ferrari does a lot of that in the estate planning part of it. Yeah, you can definitely designate in your will. A lot of people don't do that. And then, you know, everyone is fighting. If, if you're leaving everything to somebody, to your children equally and you don't designate, there there can be fighting even with that. So, Yeah, I mean, and the more people that are involved, the messier and the more expensive it gets, right? Like when it comes to little pieces of jewelry or anything like that, I mean, it could get to the point to where you have to have stuff appraised and that just doesn't make sense. I've had to have people come in and value everything in the home and then split it up item by item like that. How expensive is that to value everything in the home? Um, I, I use, it's somewhere between two to $400, I would say, to have somebody come in and itemize everything in the home. Well, that's, that's pretty terrible. cheap. I yeah, was expecting more because yeah, I know some too. companies that specialize in that and they charge more, but that they try and sell yeah. the stuff afterwards. Well, I mean, and if you have different things like expensive artwork or jewelry or things, you know, guns, things that are you know, might be more difficult to value. Specialized items. Mm -hmm. Those you might need somebody different. You're right. And and that could cost more money. So um, when it's a probate case and there's real estate involved, um, what are some of the things people should know? Like if there's a property involved and they're, they've left it in the will to, let's say, split it among three children, right? So what, you can't split a house three ways. And, and usually you would see what somebody wants to live in it. Somebody wants to sell it. Somebody's like, eh, I don't care. So normally, first of all, make sure that you've declared it your homestead. I'm actually dealing with that issue right now where somebody passed away and it was her homestead. She never declared it that. And now it's not protected from creditors in the probate. It's a really big deal right there. It, it is. Like you just breeze right through that. But what you just said is a really big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And so now this property is subject to creditor claims. Um, so that's the big thing. Make sure you do that. So that 50,000 little homestead exemption paperwork you only have to do once if you pass away and, and you have debt. Your creditors can attach to that so they can force a sale of the home even if you don't want to sell the home that your parent lived in. Wow. Um, they can force the sale. To, and, and, you know, when when somebody passes away, many times there's huge hospital bills involved at the end of life. So you might have a $60,000, $100,000, dollars $60, um, claim against the estate from a hospital that now they can force a sale of the home and take a portion of the proceeds. And that's if it's not homesteaded. That's if it's not homesteaded. And if it is homesteaded. Started. You have to, um, well, what people need to know is that you need to, it, it takes time. The, the court has to approve the homestead exemption, and then they have to approve any sale during the probate. So if you're trying to sell the property during probate, there's many steps involved in multiple court orders that have to be obtained before you can actually list it or sell it. And the um, person named as personal representative is the one that has to sign all the documents. So um, it it can it can take you know three four five months to even get all of that in, yeah. in line that's a big deal too we had one recently that um was the person was assigned as the personal representative but 
it was later discovered that she had a felony and they're like yeah no you can't you can't be the personal representative yeah <laughs> so you know that's an important thing to think about as well if you have a will and you're designated who you know who that personal representative is if they've got a spotty background or a record or anything the courts won't let them be a pr right that's right and i've also seen um I've also seen before where the will designates somebody as personal representative and, a, and they've been able to enter into a purchase and sale agreement before they were actually designated by the court. So that voided a contract and caused a bunch of issues. Yeah, I mean, it can happen. You can It can be pending, I guess, the probate, but usually it's better to wait for that to be finished. It is. Yeah, especially in this market. If you can afford it, back. though, because you have to be able to maintain the mortgage. And yeah. if the estate doesn't have liquid assets, that can be difficult. How long is that taking? Like, are most probate cases taking? <sighs> well, um, in a formal administration, it, it, the, it has to take at least four months, usually, because somebody has to be named personal representative. And then there's a th you have to publish in the newspaper for creditors to see. And then there's a three-month period for them to make claims. So that, in and of itself, that window takes the about four process. months. Yeah. yeah, that's the minimum, I'd say. And a lot of times, it takes longer than that, especially if you have multiple beneficiaries that all have to sign off on things. What are some of the things that trip it up and um, you know, make that take longer? Um, when beneficiaries are fighting, when there's a will contest, uh. um, uh, you know, somebody may say, you know, you were taking care of dad during this time. You forced him to get a new will naming you as beneficiary, or you took money from him during his life. Now there's nothing left. So there's a lot of fighting like that. And when you have a will contest, those can take years to resolve. Yeah. We, um, I had one that the property was actually listed and um, the guy had cancer and passed away during the listing and it wasn't yet sold. You know, his intention was always to get it fixed up and it never really happened. And uh, yeah, he didn't have a will. I don't even understand that, but you know, especially if you're sick, you should definitely have a will. And I would say put in a, tr in a trust too. <laughs> I would, if I knew I was passing away. Exactly. Then you don't have to deal with some of these issues and roadblocks. And um, but you don't know. What? When you're passing away. Well, I mean, if you're terminal, you would. No, well, you still don't know the exact. You don't. But you could definitely take some precautions. The interesting thing about that one is the um, that was really crazy. Like, I had to read through a bunch of court documents on that one. But the one that passed away actually owned it with the dad only. But he was married. And then the court basically stripped the dad off title. Like, uh, this was some of the documents I was reading. Anyway... Yeah, so then, and then they were divorced. That affects the chain of title. Well, <laughs> that was a fun one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Anyway, I'm your host, Katrina Madewell. Lindsay Bash here for Tampa Home Talk. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you for having me. We'll have you back another time to talk about divorce and family law, okay? Okay. All right, thanks so much for joining us this week. We're glad you're here. Uh, always looking for ideas and topics. Our author number is 813-377-2775. Call or text 813 813- 377-2775 and remember love where you live or we'll fix it welcome home love where you live